Hello everybody and welcome to module 10.3 and now we're looking at a different type of experimental design. Now this is a little bit different only because of how the data has been collected. A matched sample is an approach to collecting data that endeavors to eliminate one source of variation in your data set. So much of the process of doing a matched sample hypothesis test is very similar. In fact, it's, it's almost the same as a module nine problem where you were working with just a single population. And you'll see what I mean in just a few minutes. The real difference here is how the data has been collected. Let me just give you a very brief um, little overview of those differences. So the previous examples that we've worked with were two independent random samples where I had two samples. Each one had so many observations in them. Let's say, you know, this sample had 10 observations. Maybe this sample also had 10 observations. They could have been the same. They could have been different. Here we calculated X bar A and X bar B. And then of course we went on and we, we did a test to see if there was any difference between those two. Now, when we talk about different sources of variation, I always use with my students this analogy of, of thinking about the variation in a data set as, as if it's noise, as if it's static. And when you're doing a test, so for example, in this exercise, maybe we're doing a test like this. We wanted to see, do we have evidence to show that there's any difference between these two populations? Do I have evidence to show that there's any difference between these two populations? That's what we're trying to find. But our data set is full of noise. There's a lot of variation. Individual observations deviate a lot from that central, those central means, those, those, those averages. So what we want to try to do is try to eliminate as much of that noise as possible. So the analogy that I use with my students is that we're trying to tune in a radio station, you know, those old analog radios. The signal that you're trying to listen to there is a song or a radio station. But there's all that static, there's all that noise. And so you're trying to, you know, remove as much of that noise as possible. Maybe as where I'm living, there's a lot of mountains. So sometimes mountains can cause a lot of the noise. Well, maybe it would be easier for me to tune in that radio station if I drive to the top of a mountain and I eliminate that one source of static. Now, if there's actually a radio station there, in other words, if there actually is a difference between those two population means, by removing that source of static, by driving to the top of the mountains and eliminating that source of static, it'll be easier to find what it is I'm looking for. So when we have these two independent samples, we can think of maybe three different sources of variation, three different sources of static. One of them is variation that exists between those two samples. And really in a t-test, we're testing to see whether or not that source of noise is statistical, uh, statistically significant or not. So there may be some difference between those two samples, and that's contributing to some noise. There's some variation within each of those samples, random variation from those sample means within each of those, and that's another source of static, another source of noise. The source of noise that matters for us now is the fact that in this sample, I have 10 what we call experimental units, those things that I'm measuring, those things that are giving me a data point. I have 10 in sample A. I have another 10, a different 10 in sample B. The fact that those are different, the fact that those experimental units, those things that I'm measuring are different in the two samples, that introduces another source of variation. 
that is the one that we are going to remove. That is the source of static that we are going to remove. And by removing that source of static in a matched sample, it makes it easier to identify whether or not whatever it is we're trying to find, does it actually exist or not. So that's a very quick rundown of what a match sample is. So if we come up to this problem here, let's go through the exercise. As a bilingual country, there are benefits to speaking both official languages in Canada. This is especially true for uh, employees of the Canadian Public Service. In my past life, before I was an instructor, I worked with our federal government as an economist. In order to promote bilingualism, public servants have the opportunity to take courses in their second language, of course, taxpayer-funded. As a taxpayer-funded program, it's important to verify that it's effective. So, in order to test this, students are given an entrance exam at the beginning of the language training and then an exit exam at the end. The difference between their grades are used to determine uh, whether or not they've improved in their language proficiency. So here we have our data. Now, to, to think of this as two independent samples, well, maybe I could have had, you know, a, a group of 10 students write the entrance exam and then I have their average grade. Here's the average grade of students who are beginning the program. And then perhaps that very same day, because there's always students coming and going into these, uh, into these programs, I have another, another group of a different 10 students. So here I have 10 students write an entrance exam. Here I have a different 10 students write an exit exam. Well, then I have the average grade of a student who is starting the program. I have the average grade of a student who is just finishing the program. And then I can go ahead and I can do my test to see if there's a difference. Or, I take one set of students. So here, those are these experimental units. These are the things that I'm measuring that are giving me a data point. So I take, here I have six students. I have those six students write an entrance exam. Now I have to wait six weeks or eight weeks or something, however long it takes for them to go through the program. Then I have those exact same students write an exit exam. So here I have removed that source of noise, that source of variation that in this two independent random samples, I had 10 students in each, there were different students. Well, different students, they have different innate abilities to learn a language. And that introduces that sort of source of variation. So here I have the same students. I've eliminated that one source of variation. Now, what we do as a matched sample is I don't really calculate those sample means. Maybe this is A and this is B. Now what we do is we calculate these difference values. So these are difference values stated here, calculated exit minus entrance. So this is of course 34 minus 26. This is 51 minus 44. So really I've defined here, this is uh, my population number one and this is number two. And I'm just writing that down in case I need to come back to it because that's how these difference values have been calculated. Now what I need is the average difference. Once I have that average difference, now it becomes very much like a module nine single population test. This is my sample. And that is the sample that I use to calculate my test statistics and to perform the test. Okay, so let's get into this. There's gonna be a couple of extra little intermediate calculations that we're gonna to need to do, so it might be a little bit more time consuming. So let's, let's get into it here. So formulate the appropriate test using a 5% level of significance. So the notation here is going to be just a little bit different from what we've seen. When we are doing two independent samples, this is that notation that we would use because I'm looking to see if there's a difference between these two population means. 
So again, I'm testing for a difference between two population means. What I'm doing now is I'm testing a mean difference. So I'm not looking at a difference in means, I'm looking at a mean difference. Subtle little difference. My notation here changes really to reflect the fact that I'm, I'm doing a matched sample as opposed to those two independent samples. Now, because of how this has been set up, because these are calculated, let me just clean this up a little bit, as exit minus entrance. And what I'm trying to do here is to see whether or not there has been an improvement, right? We want to test to see the difference in these de to determine if they have improved their language profici proficiency. So I want to test for an improvement, which means that I want these differences here, calculated exit minus entrance, I want to test to see if I have evidence to show that those are positive. So this is going to be an upper tail test based on the fact that these are calculated exit minus entrance. So again, we're working with these two samples, just like previous two population tests that we have done. The one tail test, whether it's a lower tail or an upper tail, it's dependent on how you define your terms. Here, I've defined these as population one and two. That is reflected in how those differences have been calculated. That all determines what kind of test I am doing. So this is an upper tail test. Now to justify my test, I have formulated it this way so that if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, I have evidence to show that yes, there has been on average an improvement in students' language proficiency. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, I am unable to show that this taxpayer-funded pr program has led to an improvement in students' language proficiency. So there's my justification. Now, just to be thorough, we're doing this at the alpha 05 level of significance. Now, the test statistic, well, it's a little bit easier, right? Because before we had all of this stuff with all of these variances, depending on if we're assuming equal or not equal um, population variances, this one is very familiar. Doesn't that just look like a module nine test for a single population mean? The notation's a little bit different, but it should look very familiar to you. So what we need, I need some ingredients. I need that D bar and I need that S. So our D bar, that's just the simple arithmetic mean. That's just the average. Let me just clean up some of this stuff. That's just the average of our difference values. So it's really, I'm just adding all of these up, 8 plus 7 plus 3 minus 1 plus 5 plus 6, and I divide that by 6, and so I have my D bar is 4.67. S, that one's a little bit more time consuming. S is our sample standard deviation. I should use the proper notation here just to be... So those individual difference values minus the average difference, those are squared, divided by our degrees of freedom. And if I want the standard deviation, I need to take the square root of that. So I'll write this out, but you guys should at this point be familiar with this calculation. We've done this much earlier um, in the first uh, workbook, or of course in workbook two now. And so here we're looking at uh, 8 minus 4.67 squared plus 7 minus 4.67 squared plus, so I'm going through here, right? 8, 7, 3 minus 4.67 squared plus minus 1. And five and six. Oh, 
Okay, so that's our calculation for um, the numerator, divide all of that by n minus 1. n, of course, is just the number of experimental units that we have. So we only have 6. So this is all divided by 6 minus 1. Okay, so once you go through all of these calculations, you'll have that this is 3.2. Seven. I don't want to take the time to crunch through all of these numbers. It's a matter of pressing buttons on your calculator. So we have our standard deviation and we have our sample mean. So now I can put these into our formula. Our hypothesized value once again is just zero. But we can test for any magnitude of difference, just like we did when we had two independent samples divided by 3.27 over root 6. And so this gives us 467 divided by 3.27 divided by root 6. And that gives me a 3.5 as my test statistic. Okay. Well, now it's all the same. Now I have a t-distribution that has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. I have 5 degrees of freedom. And my level of significance is 0.05, and this is just a one-tail test. So let's get our critical value, and of course we'll use the p-value approach as well. So if I come down to my t-tables, there's alpha 5. I have 5 degrees of freedom. And so my critical value is 2.015. We can also find our p value. That test statistic is 3.5. So I'm looking along 3.5, I see it's up here between 0.01 and 0.005. My p-value. And so what is our conclusion? Well, here our level of significance is 0.05. Again, that's my comfort level towards committing a type 1 error. I'm willing to accept the 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. Based on this test statistic, that gives me a p-value that is less than 0.01. So it must be less than 0.05. I have a test statistic for this upper tail test that is much greater than my critical value. Both of these are leading us to a reject. So we absolutely have fairly strong evidence here to support the alternative hypothesis, which means that we, are, we have um, sufficient evidence to show that there has been a statistically significant improvement in these students' language proficiency after going through this, I don't know how long the program is, six-week or eight-week program. So we have evidence to show that the language training program has been effective. Okay, good. That's it for our first matched sample exercise. I apologize. The video is a little longer than normal just because of uh, our discussion on match sample in general. Okay, thank you all for watching. I hope that that was helpful. Take care. Bye-bye.